Let us turn now to our scripture text today, which comes to us from Joshua chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. When the entire nation had finished crossing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Select twelve men from the people, one from each tribe, and command them, Take twelve stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood, carry them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you camp tonight. Then Joshua summoned the twelve men from the Israelites, whom he had appointed, one from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder, one for each of the tribe of the Israelites, So this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the Israelites a memorial forever. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, we ask that by your spirit you would allow us to find ourselves once again in this holy drama, that we too might find you on the long journey with us as well. We ask it in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. After 40 long and very hard years of wandering through the desert wilderness, the Hebrews were finally at the border of the Promised Land. The only thing separating them from this place they had long, long dreamed about was the Jordan River, whose banks had overflowed, creating a very formidable obstacle between them and the Promised Land. Here at the beginning of the semester, the beginning of the new academic year. It may be that some of you are very excited that at long last you are about to embark into this new bright future. You are tired of all the wandering around in other pursuits, weary of the years of wandering through the pandemic anxieties and grief and loneliness, and now here you are ready to enter the promised land of theological education. (laughs) Maybe. But others of you may be much more focused on the overflowing river of obstacles that seem to be in the way. Maybe you are approaching the fall semester still tired and more than a little concerned about the workload that is coming. Or maybe you're worried about money or your health or the health of someone you love. Maybe you're still haunted by your father-in-law who just keeps asking, how exactly does one make money after studying theology? (laughs) Or maybe you're convinced that you're the only person who doesn't really belong here 
And it's only a matter of time before we figure that out. Maybe you're focused on the promised land, but I can promise you that the Hebrews at this point were very focused on this overflowing Jordan River that stood in their way. Maybe some of them were wondering if God would do for them what God did for their parents when Moses was called to reach his staff out over the Red Sea and their parents watched the seas part and seeing the dry land there, then their parents walked through the dry waterbed and began the journey to freedom. Would God do that for them as well? Well, Moses is now dead. And Joshua has assumed leadership. And sure enough, the word comes down from Joshua that God will indeed part the waters of the Jordan as well. Only this time, the instructions are a little different. This time, the people are called to just start walking towards the undivided Jordan River with the priest at the front of the line. Can't you just imagine some of the conversation among these priests <laughs> as they are in this liturgical procession towards an overflowing, undivided Jordan River, and they're heading right into it? I can tell you what at least one of them said. <laughs> Reverend Moses would have never have come up with this idea. <laughs> I don't know if this new guy Joshua is going to work out as a leader. <laughs> We've never done it this way before. <laughs> First God divides the water, then we walk through it. <laughs> no. That was then. This is now. Now, God expects the Hebrews to have learned something during those long days on the desert sojourn. And the expectation is that they have learned to walk by faith. And we're told that it is not until the soles of the priest's feet touch the water that the Jordan was cut off up into a single heap and then the people could walk through on dry land. Not, not until they stepped into undivided water. That's a step of faith, great faith. And faith is what keeps you moving when there have been no miracles. I like that sentence, I'm gonna say it again. <laughs> Faith is what keeps you moving when there have been no miracles. We have not been called to live by miracles, we have been called to live by the faith that we are expected to have learned along the way on the journey. And even the great faith that we have inherited from those who have been on the journey that we inherited. Amen. The people who've gone before us, who just kept moving towards the promised land. Even when they were convinced they had lost their way, they were convinced that they would never make it, they were convinced they were headed in the wrong directions, they were convinced that they had grave questions about their leadership, they still just kept moving. That too is a statement of faith. You just keep moving towards the promised land. 
But now you, you never want to confuse the promised land with paradise. <laughs> the promised land is just where you're called to be. And if God has called you to be at a place or with a people or with a mission, don't expect that calling to be easy. In fact, the way I read this text, you can expect it to be rather difficult. Promised Land was a place filled with adversity and obstacles and challenges and giants and struggles with people who did not want them there. Struggles with each other. Struggles even with God. That may sound like your experience with the church or the academy. It may be the promised land, but it's no paradise. It's just where you're called. And to survive in this land, let alone flourish, you're going to have to have great faith. And to be clear, that's more faith than you have in your little heart. The faith you've got in your heart, that's not going to cut it. <laughs> there are giants in the land who will scoff at your little faith. You need our faith. You need the faith of the mighty church. You need the faith of those who've gone before you. You need the faith of prophets and, and scholars and saints and, and martyrs and people who've already faced everything you could possibly face, whose faith was hammered out on the anvil of adversity and who kept coming together to say, I still believe we will move ahead. That's the faith you need. It was never faith in themselves on the journey. If the desert journey proved anything, it was that the people were about as faithless as they could be. The faith that they might have had was just faith in the God who journeyed with them. As the people made their way through the dry river bed of the Jordan, they passed by the priest who stayed in the midst of the divided waters holding the Ark of the Covenant on poles on their back. This seat of God, this sign and symbol of the presence of God with the people stayed there in the midst of the divided waters allowing the people to make their way through. Why? Because God wants to make it clear that a sacred memory was being created because that memory is going to be needed down the line. Centuries later, Isaiah calls forth this memory when he says, Do not be afraid, says the Lord. Do not be afraid, for I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the, the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. For you are precious and honored in my sight, and I love you. Do you see that memory where that comes from? That time where we dare not forget, that time where which our great faith is rooted, of a God who stays with us in the midst of the mighty waters, preventing them from ever overwhelming us. As the people completed passing their way through this divided water, God commanded Joshua to have 12 stones taken from the riverbed, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and with these stones to build a monument so that in the day to come when your children ask, what are these stones for? You will be able to tell them of the time that the Jordan was cut off in front of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, the sign and symbol of the presence of God with us on the journey. 
It's actually kind of a strange time to build a memorial. <clears throat> they were just getting started. All around the world, there are so many memorials that are built in honor of the people who've sacrificed so much in wars and in tragedies, even like 9-11. These memorials are all over the place to help us remember. But usually, we wait until the struggles and the adversity is over. Then we build the memorial. Here, they've built the memorial before they've even started the struggles. Why? Because we have to remember to move forward. We remember to move forward. Leonard Sweet has described this with the, the metaphor of a, of a child on a swing and trying to demonstrate the importance of tradition to progress. Tradition is not a conservative force. He says it's a very progressive one. Like a child on a swing, you have to lean back on the ropes. You lean back into the tradition, and then you can kick ahead. And then you lean back into the tradition deeper, and you can kick higher and higher, and you go back and forth, but you never, you never get rid of this. You have to have the member. You have to remember in order to move ahead. We begin every uh, semester with opening communion because we've been called by our Savior to do this in remembrance of him. That's how we will begin all that lies ahead, by remembering. We remember that in Jesus Christ, God has come to be with us in the midst of the waters, always with us on the journey. We remember that as Mark even introduces us to Jesus in his Gospels, the very first place we find Jesus is in the middle of the Jordan River. Isn't that fabulous? The presence of the Savior with us in the midst of the same river. We remember that in Christ we received the love of God from which we can never be separated, the perfect love that casts out all fear. And one after another, we come forward and we, we eat of his body, we, we drink of his cup. And we find the nurture that we need in this holy memory that allows us to keep moving. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.